Welcome to On The Spot. I'm your host, Norman Graham. To my far right, we have Saquon Jones. In the middle here, we got Reverend Comrade Tillett. Good to be here. We gonna open it up with you, Rev. All right. Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman has been locked up. Mm-hmm. What should we expect? Well, first of all, I just think that the African-American community should be um, inspired, and we should be reminded that whenever we fight, we win. Whenever we stand up, we make advancements. And this case was going to be swept under a rug. Yes. Uh, but but the entire African American community, from uh, radio talk show hosts, cable TV hosts, preachers, uh, politicians, activists, we all stood up. And people in the community, people in churches, had hoodie Sundays all over the country. Twitter and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook, social media. We stood up. And at least movement has taken place. Now, what the outcome will be, we can't say. We do know that the men that murdered Emmett Till were not brought to justice, okay? They, they, they beat that case. Yes. But what, 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 what Emmett Till's case did was it started um, a thrust in the civil rights movement that changed this country. And so I'm inspired because that was a 17-year-old uh, that was killed. Uh, frivolously. Uh, again, um, the Emmett Till case, uh, uh, when his mother had the courage, when that body was shipped back to Chicago, to say, let, let the world see what they did to my baby. That was right before Montgomery. Mm-hmm. And that set into motion the modern civil rights movement. Uh, and it brought down the cotton curtain. So, um, uh, Trayvon Martin case, uh, in my judgment, it's just one of those cases. I don't know if it will be that case, but it's an important case, and I'm proud of the way the African-American community responded. Now, lastly, on that point, uh, the prosecutor in the case, we don't know what will happen in the court. Corey? We, we do know that she charged him with second-degree murder, and one of the things that came out in the Casey Anthony case was that because she was charged uh, so, so low, uh, no, high with first degree murder. First degree murder. First degree murder. I'm yes. saying that, that was a different situation. Yes. But in this case, the second degree murder charge, some have said, is too high. But but one of the things that by charging him with second degree murder, uh, the prosecutor has ensured is that the judge will be able to go down uh, when he gives instruction to the jury to say that if you can't find him guilty for second degree murder, you can find him guilty for manslaughter. So I'm inspired. I I agree with Reverend. Um, In in terms of my generation, uh, this is the one thing or the first time that I've ever seen social demonstration bring about justice and change in the justice system. Um, You know, being born in the 70s, we've had very little opportunity where we had some, you know, sort of demonstrations outside of the Million Man March, which I didn't see a lot, you know, happen after that. the Rodney King situation when we demonstrated, I didn't see a lot of anything happen after that. Um, this is the first time where we had a situation for my generation to actually see outside of the civil rights uh, generation where if you're demonstrating and you're powerful and you're collective and you're going out and you're actually you know, ready to have a message that you can bring about you know, political, social, uh, and personal change within the whole country. So I'm inspired based off of that. I don't really think that my generation has seen this sort of, you know, galvanization of, of you know, every community mm-hmm. uh, and bring about a whole thing of, you know, eyes being open, uh, ears being ready to listen, and to have this man brought to justice is a, is, a, is a great opportunity to show my son and generations after me that if you come together, you can bring about change. The one thing that I do not like uh, there's never been a situation where a state prosecution who has ever sensationalized a case has ever won that case, from my perspective. You have O.J. Simpson, where the state prosecution sensationalized it. You have John Benet Ramsey, uh, the little girl in Denver, where, they, where the state prosecution sensationalized it. Maybe you had, I'm not going to agree with that. You, had, you had Casey Anthony, the, the case we just brought up, where the, prosecu- the state prosecution sensationalized it. We have Angela Corey. Is you know did, the did, prosecution has sensationalized the case. Did the that prosecution I've never seen. sensationalize or did the media? Did cable news, which is twenty four hours, well, did I don't they, think I don't think about what the, I'm going to address that too. Angela Corey had over three weeks. 
to determine if she was going to bring these charges to, against George Zimmerman. And it, was, it, would, it kept going. Three weeks, almost four weeks, she had a chance where she, where, where she was named special prosecutor for the, for the case. Where um, uh, the I forgot, I forgot the the the, fo the former prosecutor Wolf Wolfinger Norman Norman Wolfinger yes. was taken off from the time that Norf Norman Wolfinger was taken off to the time that Angela Corey was put on mm -hmm. was about a, almost a month of us trying to figure out if we are going to get a conviction. Is he going to but get but arrested? But and but it but was but sensationalized. No? But here's what I'll say. She didn't sensationalize she it. She did, the by, media by did. waiting that the long. The media did, but you know what I said, and I think I said it on the last show, why I'm not, I was kind of happy with it. And I was happy because it forced the people to unite. So the longer it took for Zimmerman to get locked up, it forced the right. people to realize that I'm angry about this. Right. And I'm, I want to stand up and be active and have my voice heard. But there's a difference between anger and result. Theory and execution are, are mutually exclusive. You can have a theory of being angry, but then the result is what we ultimately want. Like, him being arrested is just not enough. Well, you understand? And if he gets arrested and then gets released, well, the devastation that causes... Okay. by non-educated legalese individuals. For instance, the kid who, 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 the, the, the kid who protested for this mm -hmm. is going to look at it like, we did all of this, and then look what happened, yeah, nothing. But, and, know, then that, and, that, and, and then they sensationalize, this is what I see. Well, I first, several things. Uh, first of all, I hope your generation was around when all of us went to jail for... Uh, Abner Lewima. I hope that your generation was around when we all went to uh, jail for Amadou Diallo. I hope your generation was around. These are early 90s rappers. These are early 90s rappers. I mean, these are early 90s. But I don't know. They may not have been. We are, we are, you you, you got to understand, I'm 35. During right. those cases that you know, we, I'm basically right. a, a, a sophomore, freshman right. in high school. Right. No, I understand. I mean, I'm not really. But I tell you, I, in, in 19, the level that I am in, right in, now. In 1998. I called and had 2,500 young people in front of City Hall protesting uh, Amadou Diallo's uh, treatment. We took them out of school. Uh, these were high school students. Uh, Mayor Giuliani said we were irresponsible uh, for doing it, but we had them there in City Hall and we stood up. But the point I'm making is, is that, you know, on some level, Did that, we give you say that, and you know, I want to use that example. Okay, that case was sensationalized. Right. What happened? Well, that, 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 that was that what was happened? to my second one. Look, Sean Bell sensationalized. Let, let me just, what happened? Let me just make that mm -hmm. second point. I, I don't think that the prosecutor didn't sensationalize. It. We, as a community, yes. sensationalize it. One of the things that we have to realize is that the reason why activism is important is you can't be visible and invisible at the same time. And so the, the cases that the black community, people like Michael Bayston, people like Al Sharpton, people like uh, pastors all over the country, uh, I'm sure on the spot uh, dealt with that issue. We tried to bring attention. That was the sensationalism. This case happened in February. This case would have been dead had we not sensationalized this case. Yes. And we sensationalized it not for sensationalism, but we sensationalize it to bring pressure to bear on that legal system down in Florida, mm -hmm. and that's why Zimmer was arrested. Now, it, let me just say this lastly, and and this is something for all generations to understand: uh, you you success is never guaranteed, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, when Martin Luther King organized a whole city of people and others with him to not ride the buses for nine months, people didn't ride the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Success was not assured. And so we've got to teach our young generations that we have to struggle, win, lose, or draw. And sometimes we're going to win, and sometimes we're going to lose, and sometimes we'll have a draw, but we got to keep struggling nonetheless. In closing out this segment, uh, Carmelo Anthony had the, the Martin family at That's the Nick right. game yesterday yep. while they played Miami Athletes Heat. Athletes did a great job. Yes, they did. They I did put did. out on Facebook. Uh, I put up there mm -hmm. the photo with Lou Alcindor, yeah. Ali, Kareem abdul -Jabbar. Kareem abdul -Jabbar. Kareem abdul -Jabbar. Yes, yeah, Lou, right. Right. Jackie Robinson, Jim, Jim Brown. Jim Brown. I, I understand that, but I'm just purpose saying. Of that mm -hmm. was, hold on, the purpose of that was in that era, as I stated, in that era, mm -hmm. major athlete, top athletes right. in the stood industry up. Right. stood up. Right. And this is what I'm looking for in the entertainment right. and athletic community. Right. We as a community have to stand right. up and be accountable. And I'm giving them credit this this time because yeah. Miami, Miami Heat, 
uh, uh, brought a lot of attention yes. to this issue. And I want to remind Saquon that when Martin Luther King led the struggle in Montgomery, Alabama, he was 10 years younger than you are. So uh, I, I just want you to remember, I, I Martin Luther King was a hip-hop activist. <laughs> and he and, Malcolm, and, and he had, he had Malcolm never lived to be 30, never lived to be 40 years old. I, I mean, I know you're running out of time, but I'm just saying not... Not social sensationalism. I'm talking about state prosecution sensationalism. Well, I understand. There's a difference. I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying when O.J. Simpson, John Benny Ramsey, Casey Anthony, all of those, that's what I mean. There's nothing ever positive that have ever come out of those sort of situations. We'll be back. We're back. Reverend Comrade Tillett, Saquon Jones. We're having a lot of discussion off mic here. We're going to work it out right now. Next subject, presidential race. We have a Republican candidate, one, no, we, we still got Newt, but Mitt Romney is the man. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited about this, and I, mean, and I know this is going to sort of ruffle some feathers. I'm an Obama fanatic. I'm a true blue Democrat. Fiscal conservative, though, um, and this is the first time in my life that I don't feel bad about a Republican candidate. You know, I'm going to be honest. I know that, mm -hmm. I know that Mitt has flip-flopped a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a reverend, I'm sure that you've, you know, change your, your ideologies over time you know the core of, the core amount of how you think has always been the same mm -hmm. I don't truly believe that Mitt Romney can go from being a governor of Massachusetts and having these stances and um, then you know go for president and then still sort of change them um, but I'm really not mad at this race from my perspective I really want Obama to be that's him. not I the Republican that perspective, perspective is it no, that, that's just, uh, you know, just the idea that, you know, when I wanted to leave the country when Bush was uh, president, when mm -hmm. I wanted to leave the country when Ronald Reagan was president, mm -hmm. and I wanted to leave the country when, when, when both uh, Bush uh, presidents were there, I, was, I felt like this wasn't a place for me. Well, you and remember I feel, all those Republicans going way back. Well, I mean, 87, 80, 19, and I'm born in 76, right? Like, <laughs> the first president I remember is okay, Ronald Reagan in the right. 80s. I mean, I know that I'm a superhero. All I'm just getting right, right. to go through okay, time, you know? All right, all right. But, I mean, like I said, this is the first general election, and I'm not really angry with the, the, the combatants, if mm -hmm. you will, and, and I'm very excited about well, it. Well, I think, you know, uh, we have to be careful because, uh, you know, um, in the 60s and the 70s, particularly in the 60s, you had the term... Uh, um, uh, Rockefeller Republican mm -hmm. uh, and 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 Bush. If you remember, George uh, W. Bush mm -hmm. ran as a compassionate conservative, and I think that what I'm concerned about is that people forget. I, I pastored in Boston in Roxbury, and Mitt Romney was the governor of Massachusetts, and I think people need to remember, particularly us uh, supporters of Obama. That Massachusetts is the most liberal state mm -hmm. in the union. Yes. And yet Romney was able to get Democratic votes to become the chief executive in that state at a time when there was not one Republican congressperson in that state. And so what that says is that number one, now that the Republican primary is over, where people are not asking him about his religion and about uh, abortion, but indeed uh, he is just uh, um, um, a tall, uh, good-looking rich white guy that wants to help people make money we have to be careful because there are many uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton Democrats that may switch over and go with Romney because he is the type of candidate that you were just talking about as a Republican so we have to be careful well, as to get out the vote. for me but well, I mean you said uh, that he was in other words he's mm -hmm. not as as untenable he's not yeah. as he didn't turn you off as much yeah. as some of the Republicans that you've seen in the past and that is something we have to be very careful about yeah. and really get our base out because a lot of people will be supporting Romney this next six and a half months what can we expect well, I mean, Easily I'm looking. I'm looking for. I really, I really feel that. And this is. And this is. I'm gonna say something else that's gonna ruffle a couple of feathers. That I don't think that women are stepping up enough. Um, this, the Republican, uh, you know, assault on them, um, I think, has been swept underneath the rug. And I'm hoping that for the next at least very three months from now into at least July, that the Democrats would, you know, go hard and, and sort of galvanize women. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, and, and that's what I'm looking forward to, I, at least at the very minimum, uh, looking forward to where are women going to stand in this race? Mm -hmm. Are they going to stand up and stop allowing Republicans to, you know, introduce? I know as a reverend, you know, I'm not sure, if, you know, phys philosophically, I'm not sure if you're against abortion or not. You know, I mean, you philosophically, you should be against abortion. 
personally, I'm not sure where it would go from, but I'm just saying that, you know, I don't think that women are doing enough in, in this Mm-hmm. Situation um, to go from there. So hopefully, in the next six months, that's where I see. Wherever I'm pivoting to. Okay, uh, so I just think, let yeah. me just let it's yeah. going to be the nastiest presidential election oh, oh, yes. we've ever seen. Without a doubt. Yeah, no but I'm going to just tell you why. Because, for example, uh, Sean Hannity was talking about the, the Democrat assault on women. Of course, they're, they're renaming this here to the Democrat assault. Right. And that's how they're going to do it with what was the lady named Hillary, Hillary Rosen with her statement she right. made. Mm-hmm. But we need to pivot to state politics. We had a big announcement this morning. After coming from a meeting, a community meeting yesterday, mm-hmm. where we discussed mm-hmm. how to get Ed Towns, Hakeem Jeffries, and Charles, Charles Barron, which are all running for the 9th Congressional District. Ed Towns have had that seat since Ronald Reagan was in office. And how can we get Ed Towns to come to one of the debates? Ed followed up with, mm-hmm. I'm retiring. Mm-hmm. So you have Charles Barron and Hakeem Jeffries. And mm-hmm. You start with you, Well, so it's going to be an exciting race. I always said in this race that our community, we had an embarrassment of riches. We had three strong candidates, okay? And uh, now that the incumbent has gotten out, yes. two things. I think, first of all, I tip my hat to Congressman Towns because he could have won this race. Uh, and if he stepped aside to make room for the next generation, then I think he's doing much better by us than Charles Rangel is doing by the people of Harlem. Without a doubt. And so I take my hat off to him for stepping out. And now we have a race indeed between two great candidates. And I think that Barron has got to show um, that he um, he can moderate some of his positions and that he can have a big tent. And Hakeem Jeffries, I think, has to be careful that he doesn't allow himself to be seen as property of county and of the uh, folks outside of this congressional district. Yes, we just to say, you know, we moved, you know, we moved in to um, some parts of Canarsie. We was already there, but we moved into Howard Beach. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't, I don't, I, I think that w- what we need to be conscious of is that the seat will be up for grabs in the next ten years. Um, I, obviously, with gentrification within a substantial portion of the districts that after it's been, you know, re, re, uh, re realigned. Mm-hmm. Um, in the next, you know, five to ten years, I mean, we, we are not going to have a, a candidate like Ed Towns who can afford not to show up at meetings and not be socially engaged um, and continue to be reelected. Uh, Rev has countlessly said, you know, generational gaps and, you know, during his time and all this other stuff. And from my perspective, I just don't see Ed Towns as done, doing anything of great importance uh, during my lifetime or the time where I've been a homeowner within the community. Um, my di- my house is literally across the street from the district, so I- I've been pretty, you know, engaged in what would possibly go on. And I've been in my house for almost 10 years. I haven't seen anything. I saw that guy at a train station one time during re-election. So I'm sick of these African-American do-nothing based off of my name and get re-elected, you know, candidates. And I say good riddance. I'm not really in love with the candidates that we have right now, um, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, but I know that at the end of the day, you know, maybe something good will come out of this. And we have to be conscious that during the general election, it's going to be, you know, a person of another ethnicity who may potentially challenge either Hakeem Ethnicity or, or political party? And, and ethnicity in this district. Oh. Yes. Okay. You know, yes. it's not going to be a situation where we're going to say that this is a completely black uh, congressional district. You um, get based somebody out of Howard Beach? Exactly. Well, well no, but you know? the, the, the way, as I've... Uh, looked at the lines, the the uh, congressional district remains largely an African American yes. district, which is important because it's true, it's important mm-hmm. and, and and it's a voting rights district, and yeah. so we. But that don't mean so, they're going to. So, I mean, but you have a substantial portion. I mean, you being in Best Stock, um, right. Reverend, is, is you've seen, and I, I live, you know. Uh, in a, on the board of Best Stuy, Crown Heights, and Prospect Heights, right. and there's a, contri- a tremendous amount of new individuals. The saving grace is the fact that I don't personally believe that they have changed their voter registration yet to fit their new community. Um, right. But once you get these new voters or these new residents to galvanize and, and sort of take a, pay attention to politics uh, within their community, I mean, I, I look at that changing dramatically over the next five to ten years. Well, as the expression goes, it'd be a cold day in hell, in my judgment, before this becomes a Republican district in the middle of Central Brooklyn. Yeah, they almost thought that with David Yasky, too, and look what happened. Mm-hmm. If he didn't have, I guarantee you, when David Yasky ran for Mayor, Ma- Major Owens' district before Major Owens got out, if there were one black candidate in that race, Yasky would have won. And, and I, I truly believe that. If I had hit the lottery... Mm-hmm. I probably would have bought a retirement home 
somewhere out on in the Hamptons somewhere. Okay. But I didn't win it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you was going to say something else. That's the way the game is played. All right, well, you know. We'll be back after this message. <laughs> We're back. Next subject, the death of Gil Noble, an icon, a legend yep. in our community. Take our hats off to a broadcast gi a giant. He was a giant. That's right. No, I mean a giant in, what, in wh whose eyes. Now, I appreciate the, ide the ideology associated with Gil Noble, from my, but from a generational perspective, I watch like it is, and I've seen what he's done, and I did not see any transition over to someone new. The death of Gil Noble, in my, Gil Noble in my eyes would be almost as if a very rich, powerful man left no will to see how to distribute his wealth, his life work, and, and I think that that was the sort of travesty associated with this, and from a generational perspective, I mean, that just says a lot that someone of my age may not even know who Gil Noble is, and he didn't bring anybody else in to sort of connect the two. Um, and that's my assessment. I think he's a great man and, and, and should be commended as such. But you look at it from a grassroots level or from a perspective of my generation, how does, how does he connect to us? How, how did he connect to us? You want that us? first, right? Well, you know, I, first of all, I, 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 not knowing the politics at WABC and yes. knowing that groups like Seam Hotep, uh, Dr. James McIntosh and, and Betty Dobson have, uh, and many other community groups together, engaged in a lengthy process in trying to negotiate uh, a successor to Gil Noble. But that being said, um, not knowing the politics there, I will concede that it is a tragedy mm -hmm. that a younger person was not groomed and that show uh, uh, will not continue in the form that it was. However, uh, I think if anything, your point reminds us that how important stations like TV One and BET, when it was owned by blacks, are so that we could tell our story. But as far as Gil Noble, I mean, his contribution uh, to African American consciousness and enlightenment, you may not see it, but I guarantee you, you have the benefit of growing up in a community, in a city, in an African American community that Gil Noble contributed significantly to having a high level of understanding of information. Uh, he is one of, the, when you talk about New York's African American community, if you talk about Adam Clayton Powell, you talk about Dr. Ben, Dr. John Henry Clark, but Malcolm X, you gotta point, talk right? about you gotta add Gil Noble. Gil Noble's a what part the, of that. What's the average age of the individuals that you named? I mean, they are. Well, but they are, they are, you know, uh, and then but, but this, I don't just be misconstrued as me talking down about Gil Noble or me degrading his life work because that okay. is not my intent. Right. My intent is, is that, from my perspective, the African American men of that generation okay. did not pass on or were not able or, or not willing to transition over to young, younger people. Okay, hold, hold on. Let, let me just say one last thing. We talked about the about Major Holmes. We talked about Hill. You, 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 keep, saying, from you keep saying your generation. First of all, I do want to say your generation, like every generation before you, has a responsibility to learn history. See, everything I know about, I wasn't there to experience. And so it's in, history is a responsibility of every generation. Your generation, and, and I love this generation, but even in the, 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 the cultural uh, uh, form that you most love, hip-hop, you all don't even know rappers speak for 10 or 15 right. years ago. No, see, that's a rapper that's from no, no, five no. years ago is considered oh, speak, irrelevant. Speak, so, speak, so speak. So we got to get away from this microwave, jack-in-the-box mentality. No, but that's what generation. you have to do, right? Because no, you're no, assuming no. that as uh, when I say my generation, right. that I automatically like rap. Now, I may have grew up on rap, right. but when I say my generation, I'm talking about affluent, educated, right. African-American individuals, not... To be lumped in with the guy with his pants off his behind, dropped out of high school, who I would who say the same about thing. To, I would say the same day. thing to Jay Z. But that's the same. But that. But and the, he's affluent. But you're putting my, you're putting me in a box as well when you say that because you, I, and I, and I, and I understand why you do it. Right. But when you say your generation, you're automatically assuming that there's a hip hop generation that wears, and that's not the case. But well, it doesn't matter to me whether they wear Brooks Brothers suits or the pants <laughs> now. The point is, the, the, yeah. you have. 
to, every generation, ha just because you weren't there, or just because something happened before you came into consciousness, it doesn't absolve that generation of a responsibility of learning about those. So would it be fair, That's right? the phenomenon so let me just say, I don't want to take away from you. I don't want to take away from you. Let me, get, let me ask you one last and question. And Gil right? should be honored and respected. And, and, I, and I do respect and honor Gil. I don't want that to be misconstrued. Gil I was dead before I want to ask you a question, sure. though, right? Should I do the same thing that you've done to me and lump me in a box where I say that mm -hmm. I grew up with about 14, 15 men, okay. boys. Only out of that 14 or 15 men, two of us have fathers in the house. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a father. Your hair is curly. You got a nice little light. You <laughs> might be my dad, um, Reverend. No. And I may not even know it. No. You understand? So should I lump your generation into what? all of those men who <laughs> skipped out? Or my generation, well, and now we're raising the hood out of let, foundation. Let, 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 let me, is it fair for me to do that to you or Norman? Let me let me t step into this on on Gil. I met Gil when C Councilman James Davis got killed. He mm -hmm. called me, mm -hmm. and he knew I had footage, and I've never really shown anybody. We c came down to ABC. We talked for a long time. Gil said, "I like what you're doing. I've seen your work. We looked at a few videos, and he said, you know what? I'm going to mentor you.'" And he told me a story. The story was about Ali in the 60s. He met Ali in a restaurant. It might have been Cassius at that time, in a restaurant. Ali always liked to wash his hair. He said, Ali told his handlers, tell him to come here. It was a bunch of reporters, and they're all white. He was the only black reporter. Everybody else tried to come with him. He said, Gil only wants him. So now, he called Gil in, and he said, I'm going to give you this interview, hopefully to help launch your career. He said, but I want you to remember something. He said, I want you to remember to pass the torch. Mm -hmm. When you get in a position, pass the torch to someone else. Did he do that? So Gil said to me, and that's why I wrote on Facebook, I remember our conversation. Gil said to me, he said, Norman, I'm going to mentor you to take over because you have the production equipment and everything to do it, and I like what you're doing. So now when I would call Gil, he didn't know he wasn't always available. He was fighting for his career on ABC. ABC mm -hmm. was cutting his budget. Right. They was trying to take him off the air. He didn't have the personnel right. that he had. So he taught me little things about, okay, how to ask questions to guests and everything else when you're asking, but you don't want them to know that you're asking. So for that brief time we was there, I learned a lot. I felt that when I was called Gild and asked him for people numbers so I can get on the show, Gil wasn't available for it, but you know what I learned why? Because he might have still been watching, and I don't think I was ready. Because Gil never changed who Come he on, was. No, I don't think I was you, ready, you, and I'm you, big you enough to him, say it. I mean, no, I'm, no, no, I'm giving him a lot that much credit. I don't think when he took that show for over 40 years that I was available, I was able to step into the footsteps that he did. Because right, well, Gil so provided an excuse for, for not the, being transitioned. You're providing an <laughs> excuse on why it was. I don't see how that is relevant in the sense of him not passing a torch. He eight million people or nine million people in New York City alone will now never know, you know, what like it is 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 about now because it's going to be taken off the well, air. Like I said, I, 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 like I said, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think you, you raise an important point. But again, again, this is why TV One, mm -hmm. BET. Inner city broadcasting when they were black owned and, and the, the visionary Percy Sutton, mm -hmm. Bob Johnson, people like uh, uh, Kathy Hughes are vital and important and on the spot because we have to have the ability and the platform to tell our story. And that's why no matter what people say about the black church, I can go to a pulpit every Sunday and say what the good Lord inspires me to do. And I don't have to worry about anyone over my head other than the Lord telling me what I can and cannot say. Well, our motto in closing it out is, he who controls his media tells his story. And All this right. is why we do what we do. But we do need help. We're out.